Romans 14 verses 1 through 5. I read from the King James text today. And the King James text today reads, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despiseth him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Master, we love you, God. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you. Who for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost that I feel today in the house of the Lord. I knew this was going to be a special week and I just knew. I could tell Lord by the presence of God that we felt in the truck driving up here from Alabama. I knew that today was going to be a day of blessing that the Holy Ghost was going to touch Oh my God, there is none that would come to me, saith the Lord, that I would reject. There is none that turns to me that I refuse. I speak to you at this hour. Hear my voice and know that I speak to you. I will receive you. Come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, and I will indeed give you rest, saith the Most High. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. O oh Lord, anoint today the messenger of God. Anoint today the preacher of the gospel that I might deliver unto the people of the my God. I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh my God, how the whoo, glory. I feel the presence of the Lord in a way Hallelujah, that I was not expecting to feel the presence of the Lord over this message today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to our heart, not merely our hearing. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Ooh, I gotta tell you, oh my God. I feel the Holy Ghost. And, and when, the, when the Lord gave me this message, you know, I, I didn't expect this kind of anointing to come on me for this message. But every once in a while, the Holy Ghost will put an anointing on me that is so powerful. And for some reason today, he has chosen to do that for this message. Glory to God. An open heart and a made up mind. A lot of believers today are of the mindset that they have to uh, be selective about those that they open themselves up to and those uh, whom they communicate with and they fellowship with and those with whom they interact. And the Word of God tells us, listen, have no fellowship, listen, with the unfruitful works 
of darkness. If you read what the apostle was saying in context, then you will understand that what he was saying was, as a child of God, we do not involve ourselves with any religious or ritual practice which contradicts our faith. Therefore, you will not see me sitting in a Buddhist meeting or in a Hindu meeting or in a Muslim meeting. Do you follow what I'm saying? I cannot go into a Muslim uh, house, house of prayer. I cannot go into a Hindu temple. I cannot interact with them. I cannot have any fellowship, listen, with the unfruitful works. Many Christians take that passage out of context and brother, they try to tell you, well, I can't be around gay people because the Bible said that I'm not to have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's right, you gay back. So don't get in bed with it. You're not to do the things that you disagree. But that does not speak of the people. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. I can fellowship, I can be around, I can spend time with, I can communicate with, I can have friends who are everything from Muslim to Satanists. Oh, Pastor, I can't believe you said that. I sure did, I'll tell you why. How in the world am I going to win a Satanist if I won't talk to him? Right, that's right. My Bible says that your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Well, there's the problem. Most Christians have got good works. Their actions stink. Their conduct is lousy. They're judgmental. They're critical. They're nasty. They're condemnatory. Yes, yes. No wonder you can't win anybody to Christ. Who on earth wants to be like you? Right. You got to look like Jesus before anybody's going to want to look like you. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to be like my black brethren today. I'm going to repeat myself. You got to be like Jesus before anybody wants to look like you. But the word of the Lord said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I'm going to tell you, if you're living this thing the way you ought to be living, I'm not going to go to a wicked gathering. I'm not going to be part of any ritual put on by a Satanist or by a wicked or by someone who practices these things. But am I afraid to be around them? Am I commanded by Scripture not to have anything to do with the people? No, I am not. But I am told not to be involved in their works of darkness. I'm not to be involved in those specific actions which they uh, take part in with which I disagree that contradict my faith. But you know in this passage the Apostle Paul says something that unfortunately a lot of Christians a lot of Christians don't get this. They don't understand this and it drives me the wall that Christians cannot understand this simple principle. Paul said, him that is weak in the faith. So he is implying right from the start, listen to me, he is implying right from the beginning of this passage that the person of whom he speaks, listen, is in the wrong. They're weak in the flesh. What does that mean? That means they're really not where they ought to be spiritually. They're not mature. They're not grown. They're not well established. But Paul says, him that is weak in the flesh, uh, in the faith, receive ye. He said, don't have any problem letting someone be part of the fellowship and the church who may not understand everything just 
just right. Who may not believe everything just right. Who may not yet have a clear understanding of all things true. A lot of churches, man, I need to tell you, you let somebody come in and they don't understand everything just right. And everybody but the preacher is preaching at Everybody but the preacher is trying to straighten them out and fix them. Well, mm -hmm. tell you something, that ain't your job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get ahead of myself in this message today. Too many people don't understand the work of the ministry. And you know, as a child of God sitting in the pew, you need to learn to let the preacher do his job. To let the teacher do their job. To let the evangelist do their job. And you hear what I'm telling you now. And don't you be trying to do it for them. God ain't called you to that. If God never called you to be a teacher, listen to me children. You ain't got no business trying to teach anybody anything. When you get every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the church trying to straighten everybody else out on every issue with which they disagree, do you know what you wind up with? Well, tell you, I know I've been in this church. I've been in the faith my whole life. I've been in Pentecost my whole life. You wind up with a church full of confused people. Because Brother Jones wants to straighten this poor kid out. He doesn't understand the oneness of God. So Brother Jones is going to straighten him out. And he's going to explain it to him. And he is not anointed to teach. So he explains it to him. And just makes the kid even more confused than he was to start with. And then Sister Smith decides she's going to do it. But guess what? She comes at it from a whole different angle. She comes at it from a whole different perspective. And the kid sits there and listens and says, well, now I'm really confused. Because this one said this, and this one said this, and now I really don't get it. We create more problems in the church, listen to me, when everybody thinks they're a preacher, when everybody thinks they're a teacher. Oh, Paul said, if your gift is teaching, then teach. If your gift is preaching, then preach. But if you have not been called of God and anointed to either of these offices, keep your mouth shut. Paul said, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful dispensation, uh, disputation. He said, don't be getting into these uh, confusing conversations. Don't be getting into these debates with people. More people have been chased out of the church over the centuries by some dangling in the pew who thought that it was their job to straighten every other brother and every other sister out. I'm going to tell you, most churches, I, I'm telling you, I've been in this thing my whole life. I know what I'm talking about. Most churches... People don't leave the church because of the pastor. Oh, my Lord. They leave the church because of some big one in the pew. It was some fool in the pew that chased them out. It was some believer in the pew who caused them to feel unwelcome. It was some believer in the pew who caused them to feel like they were being pushed away. And they were being pushed out. And they were being ostracized. Most of the time when somebody hangs up in the house of God, when they wind up abandoning their faith in Christ, when they wind up leaving the fellowship of God's people, it's because somebody was trying to do something that they were not called to do. I told the story before in my first church. I had a lady in my church, bless her heart. She come to me one Sunday. And she said, oh, Brother Marm, you know, that sweet church of God way. Just so sweet. You almost, you almost taste the honey in your mouth. They're so sweet. Oh, Brother Marm, Sister Jean, 
Susan has been coming to our church now for several months and she still cuts her hair and she still wears makeup and she still wears pants outside of the church. Back then I was real strict, folks. Don't confuse this with the present. This was then. That is the old saying. Oh, that was then, this is now, okay? But this was then. She's still doing all these things that we don't believe in and we teach against us now. She said, and I feel led of the Lord to talk to her about these things. And I looked at this sister and I said, really? I said, do you know what you ought to feel led of the Lord to do? I'll never forget it. I was a 19-year-old preacher. God is my eternal witness. This happened. God is my, he can strike me dead right now if I didn't say exactly what I'm about to say. I looked at her, I said, you know what y'all would feel led to do? She said, no what? And gave me that super sweet Church of God lady smile. And I looked at her, I said, you should feel led of the Lord to shut your mouth. I said, let me tell you something. As the pastor, which is synonymous with shepherd, it is my job, my job to teach. It is my job to determine whether the sheep are healthy, whether the sheep are growing, whether the sheep are eating right, whether or not the sheep are sick. I said, I'm going to tell you, from my perspective as the shepherd, June is doing very well. She's growing in the Lord. She's learning. She may not be growing as fast as you want her to grow. She may not be learning as fast as you want her to learn. But I said, let me tell you something. All I see in that lady is progress. And if you go to her with your, let me help you fix yourself. Because you've got this one with you, and that one with you, and this one with you, and that one with you. I said, you're going to push her right out that door. And instead of me, the shepherd, being able to do my job, which Jesus said to Peter was, feed my sheep. Instead of me being able to feed the sheep and help them grow and help her become what God would ever to become. He said, you're going to push her right out the door. I said, don't you say a word to her. I'm going to tell you something. When I was holiness, and I told you, I went through an internship in the Church of God. I interacted with most of the members of that church. They knew how I believed. If they asked me, do you really believe, you know, a woman should cut her hair? Do you really believe this and so, you know? I'd say, well, yeah, I do. I said, and, and here's why. You know, and I'd tell them. I won't tell you a little secret. A lot of those people changed their ways. A lot of those people started doing some of the things that I talked about. But did I make it my mission to go out there and fix everybody? No. If they didn't bring it up, I didn't bring it up. If they didn't ask me, I didn't answer. So the pastor knew, he knew me, and he knew that I was not out there trying to push my agenda, my beliefs, my convictions on others. No, I kept that to myself because I'm not the pastor. If you're not the pastor, you will not answer to God in the judgment for what came off of this pulpit. You will not answer to God in the judgment for what you taught those people. I'm going to answer to God for that. And what I don't need a bunch of people doing is getting in the mix and fudging up everything and messing everything up and putting a stick through the, through the uh, spokes of the wheel and causing people to land on their head because you're creating confusion. I'm going to tell you something. If you talk to enough believers, you'll find out that we all have different opinions about many different subjects. You talk to enough Christians, you'll find out in a hurry that a lot of Christians have different ideas. And when you start dealing with believers who are young and new to the faith and they're novices and they're just coming in, they may come in with all kinds of crazy ideas. Well, I 
believe in I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in past lives, and I also believe in reincarnation, and I also believe in that. And the minute some person says that, the believer next to them goes into panic mode. think we got to fix it. You know what? Because most believers are not even trying. Listen to me, children. I know this is good teaching today. Most Christians are not even trying to follow the mandates that God has given to pastors and bishops and leaders in the church. What are those mandates? Be patient. Be gentle. Most people in the pew, they're not even thinking from a place of patience. They're not even thinking from a place of gentleness. You hear what I'm telling you now? And they wind up coming at that person. Every barrel they got is pointed at that poor person. And they're firing off scripture. And they're shouting and screaming and preaching and hollering. God never called you to do that. Keep your mouth shut. Let the pastor do his job. That person is new to the church. They may not come around for a year. That's okay. That's okay. There's a program in the Christian world. Many churches have Christian schools and they utilize this program that is referred to as Accelerated Christian Education. ACE, A-C-E. That is the curriculum that they use. A-C-E is an individualized curriculum. It allows for a classroom to have 30 students and one teacher. Listen to me now. And those 30 students can be anywhere from kindergarten to 12th grade in the same class. You say, well, how in the world is that going? Well, because... They have, wall, they have discs that are built against the walls around the room. And each student is reading. You go through these booklets that they give you. And as you read, you take little tests. You take little, uh, what do they used to call them? Not a test, but a huh? quiz. Quiz, that's the word. I couldn't think of the word quiz. And it, they'll have little quizzes, you know. Then when they get all done with the book, you bring it to the teacher. The teacher goes through it, make sure everything is done. Then he administers the test. He gives you a test and you take the test. If you pass that test, then you move on to the next book. Now here's the thing about ACE. Every student learns at their own speed and at their own level. You're never advanced to the next grade, so to speak, simply because you got through a year of school. No. You've got to get through that curriculum to advance to the next level for a year. You follow me? So there may be a 12-year-old who's a little slow and has difficulty reading or learning. That's okay. Because they may be, instead of being in... Uh, 12 year old would be in what? Like 5th, uh, 6th grade, something like that. Instead of being in 6th grade, they may still be at the 4th grade level. But you know what? They're going to learn what they need to learn before they move on. It's not about just going through time. It's about learning the material. The person, I, to be honest with you, I went whizzing through the material and I was way ahead of myself. I started taking college level studies, literally, because the, the high school stuff, I pretty much whizzed through and I went a little further ahead. You could do that too. So if you were somebody who could learn, if you were somebody who didn't have a problem learning or reading. Now listen. If you were reading and you had a trouble with what you're reading, then you would put a little American flag up on your desk and the teacher would come and work with you one-on-one. -on -one. So now, if you have a classroom of 30 
And 28 of them don't really have a problem learning, you know, on their own and reading and learning and all that. That allows the teacher to invest all their time in the two who do have trouble. So it's really a good program. It's really, listen to me children, it's really a biblically based program. Every believer in the church doesn't learn at the same level. Not everybody in the house of God is as wise or as knowledgeable or as experienced or as teachable as the next person. Some people, before they're ever going to be able to learn anything, they have to learn humility. Before you can ever teach them about the gifts of the Spirit, before you can ever teach them about uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, before you can ever teach them about the oneness of God, before you can ever teach them about the divinity of Christ, listen to me, they have to first learn humility. So while you're busy trying to convince them of this doctrine or that doctrine, the reality is, honey, you're trying to teach them something they're not yet ready to learn. But God is a powerful, wonderful, amazing God. He has a way. I've been pastoring a lot of years. And believe it or not, before I came out and started affirming ministry, I pastored hundreds of people. Okay. Now, I didn't have these little scant crowds. In the mainstream, I had very nice congregations. I've preached in front of congregations that had thousands. Okay, But listen to me. God is amazing. It, it is amazing to me how the Lord will have me preach a message. And during the course of my message, I'll wind up going off on these little caveats, you know. I'll kind of wander off here for a minute. Or I'll kind of wander off there for a minute. And then I have to bring myself back to my main text. And do you know what happens after church? We had a lady in Texas who was part of, she's still part of our church uh, now. Sister Cynthia and her husband Scott, they've been part of our church for over a decade now. I baptized her in Jesus' name. Went down to Austin, Texas, so I could baptize her in Jesus' name. And Sister Cynthia has, has said to me on so many occasions, and thank you, Cynthia, I love you, I appreciate your feedback. She has told me so many times, she said, Pastor, your ministry has changed my life. She said, you have no idea how... Your ministry has affected my life. And this is a straight girl. Okay? Half our ministry online is straight. Okay? Half is LGBT, the other half. So our ministry is by no means strictly LGBT. We can minister to anybody. So listen to me. Sister Cynthia, though, she came from an Episcopalian background. People that come in to the house of God, you don't know where they're coming from. Tommy grew up in a pseudo-Christian cult. That is what the Jehovah's Witnesses are. I'm going to tell you plainly. Just like Mormonism, they are a pseudo-Christian. What do you mean by that? It means they try to cloak themselves as Christians. But their doctrine is anything but biblical Christianity. Believe me, anything but biblical Christianity. It is so far off the mark, it's not even funny. They don't believe in the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. And that God turned Michael the Archangel into a man. And that as a man on earth... Michael was called Jesus and he was absolutely nothing more than a man. So they deny the divinity of Christ. They deny that Jesus is God at every possible level. They deny that he physically rose from the dead, which i got news for you, is a foundation doctrine of the Christian faith. 
You cannot believe that his spirit emerged from the tomb and his body just evaporated. No, that is not what the Bible teaches. Jesus literally sat and ate and drank with the apostles in order to prove to them that he had physically risen from the dead. There is, oh hallelujah, there is a reason. Here's one of them caveats I was talking about. There is a reason why when they came into the tomb, they didn't simply find the clothing that he had been wrapped in laying on the slab, uh, hosh posh. No, it was folded neatly and set at the head where his head had lied. Isn't that what the scripture tells us? You know why? Oh, 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 I'm going to get happy because Jesus Oh, be in God. The word of the Lord said, Paul, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. It was not possible for him to remain dead. Period. It was not possible. There was no possibility in the universe that Jesus could remain dead. Why? Because he was God, honey, manifest in human form. It was impossible. You can't kill him. You might kill the body for a few days, but honey, the minute he decides he wants to take it back up again, he's going to put it on like a robe. He's going to put his cloak from the bed. He's going to uh, take that blanket and those sheets, and he's going to fold them up and lay them at the head, and he's going to walk out of that tomb the same way he went in, a physical flesh and blood man, but a man no longer dead, but alive. Hallelujah. People that don't know where Tommy comes from. People that don't understand his background. You try to come at him in the wrong time. You try to come at him at the wrong time. And you try to push something on him that you think he needs to understand. And you don't get it. You don't understand. He has spent a lifetime being programmed to believe something very different. Sometimes people in that situation, they need time. They don't need you preaching at it. They don't need you telling them stuff. They need time. Give them time. The word of the Lord said that the anointing is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. The word of God is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Sometimes you cannot turn that obstacle into a non-obstacle. You cannot turn that stone into dust on the ground over which you might walk. You cannot do that in a moment's time. But if you chip at that stone, and you chip at that stone, and you chip at that stone, and you chip at that stone, after a year, after two years, after three years, all of a sudden, guess what? There is no longer an obstacle in the way because the stone has been turned into crushed stone. But it takes time. And the pastor, listen to me children, knows this. So when I'm working with people, when I got people in the church and I know they come from a certain background, I know they've had certain experiences, I know they've had certain bad experiences or what have you, I know how to be extra patient with them. I know how to extend extra patience to them. I know how to approach them. Do you follow what I'm saying? But what will happen is what I started to say a moment ago about Sister Cynthia. She came up to Dallas. She used, whenever she would come into Dallas, she'd always come to church. Otherwise, she'd be with us online. Well, one Sunday she came. I think it was her first time coming to our church uh, in person. And she had been following us online. And she came to our church and she brought a friend of hers, this lady of color. And the two of them came. And they were in our service for the first time physically in the service, I think. And after the service, Sister Cynthia said to me, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. She said, before we came to the service tonight, 
My friend and I were talking about four different things that we have always wondered about and we've always questioned and we've always tried to understand but we never could wrap our mind around it. She said, do you know that tonight in the course of your message you literally hit on all four of those things and answered every single one of those questions. That's what she told me. She said it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. She said in the first, but you know what? I, it wasn't all the message. Some of it was those little caveats that I went off on. That little caveat I just went off on about the resurrection. There may have been somebody out there who didn't understand the concept of a physical resurrection. But you know what? When I went off on that little side note, you know, all of a sudden God was able to reveal it to them. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So you see, if you let it the preacher do his job. He is called to preach. If you let the teacher do their job, they are called to teach. Then they are working, listen to me children, they are working in conjunction with the anointing. Because God don't call nobody that he doesn't anoint. And that anointing, the word of the Lord tells us, is what teaches us. So let the leadership, if I may say it that way, let them do their job. And he that is weak in the faith, receive me. Don't, don't get into arguments. Don't get into debates. Don't try to teach them. Don't try to straighten them out. Paul said, for one that believeth that he may eat all things, he said, and another who is weak. So he is literally defining and describing this person as weak. So what does that tell you? That means they really don't understand things the way they ought to. They're not in the right. He said, he that is weak eateth herbs. Got news for you, Seventh Day Adventists. Paul describes y'all as weak. Because y'all think you've got to eat the Old Testament diet. And Paul said, no, that's wrong. Anybody believes that way is weak in the faith. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But just because somebody, listen now, you've got to understand this. In this passage, Paul's talking about a couple points of the law. Oh, I'm going to get some mainstream Christians mad at me now. When you are a Jew and you're addressing points of the law, listen to me now, this point is very, very, very important. You can be talking about any, any, any point of the law. In other words, the minute you bring the law into the conversation, you can be talking about which meat you eat, but because of the way the law was designed to work, and that is you must obey every law, because if you break a single one, then you're guilty of all. So because the law works in that way, the moment you begin to talk about any point of the law, any, you could insert in the conversation there any other point of the law. Any. Say, Pastor, what do you mean? All right, I'm going to make a point. Paul's talking here about whether you believe in eating meat or eating herbs. Paul's talking here about steaming one day above another. He could be talking about homosexuality. He could be. He could be. He could be. Because the minute you talk about any point of the law, you could be talking about any other point of the law because anyone you can insert here doesn't matter because the law is such that to break one, you've broken them all. Yes, sir. When you understand that, 
line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Study yourself thyself, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you understand how the truth of God is imparted, then you're able to understand, okay, Paul here is talking about points of the law. Therefore, he could be, you could be talking about any point of the law you want to talk about. Doesn't matter which one you want to talk about. You could be talking about the one that deals with a man lying with a man is with a woman, as well as you could be talking about one that talks about don't eat shellfish. Because to be guilty of one, you're guilty of all. And nowhere does the Word of God say, if you're guilty of one, as long as it only relates to diet, because those are lesser laws. No, Christians have created that foolishness. Christians, especially fundamentalists and evangelicals, have tried to create the ceremonial law and the moral law. No, 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 no. Got news for you. God, don't look at it that way. The law was the law was the law. So whether you broke one of the ceremonial laws or whether you broke one of the moral laws as defined by fundamentalists, you broke the whole of it. So the minute Paul talks in our primary text today about points of the law, he may as well be talking about any other point. Therefore, I say to you, he that is weak in the faith. If somebody comes in the church and they hold a position you don't agree with on this issue or that issue, whether it be a ceremonial point of the law or a moral point of the law, keep your mouth shut. Receive it. But not to doubtful disputation. Don't get into arguments. Don't get into debates. Sure, he, uh, he, he thinks you can be gay and Christian. Well, that's insane. I need to fix him. I need to straighten him out. No, you need to shut your mouth. That's what you need to do. Because in the end of our primary text, the Apostle Paul says, Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Let me tell you. I told the lady at the jewelry store who was fixing my watch, you know, sizing it the other day for me. I told her, I said, you know what? I don't mean to sound mean, but I couldn't give a cat's tail what you think or anybody else on the planet thinks about a person being gay and being Christian. Don't matter to me no kind of way. I could care less. I could care less what... Uh, Franklin Graham's belief is I could care less what Kenneth Copeland's belief is. I could care less what Rod Parsley thinks about it. You know why? Because my Bible said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I'll tell you a little secret. I can have an open heart. I can love people. I can accept people. I can embrace people. I've got a friend in Dallas that we rented from for a few years for our church. We rented a storefront space. He's Muslim. He used to stand. He told me this. I didn't hear this secondhand. He told me. He said, I used to stand sometimes, Charles, outside of your, your church and listen to you preach. That's what he told me. And you know what else he said? He said, I like your message. I like your message. He said, one of these days I'm going to come inside. That's what he told me, literally. A Muslim man. He said, one of these days I'm going to come inside. He said, I've listened to you and I like your message. Oh, I want to tell you something. I can have an open heart. I can embrace people. I can love people that believe differently than I do. But you know what? i got a made-up mind as well. Hallelujah. You ain't going to convince me that Jesus ain't God. 
Yes. You ain't going to convince me yes. that God isn't one. Yes. You aren't going to convince me that the way to heaven is anything but Acts 2.38. You're not going to convince me that there's any legitimate baptism in water except for baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You're not going to convince me that the Holy Ghost baptism don't come with the gift of tongues. Hallelujah. That when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you will manifest that with the physical evidence of speaking with other tongues. You ain't going to convince me, honey, that any of these things are not true because I can have an open heart and at the same time have a made up mind. Yes, yes. Too many believers think, well, but if I open my heart to people, aren't I risking my beliefs? Aren't I risking my faith? Not if you got a made up mind. <laughs> Paul said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. One thing that troubles me, I've talked with people, uh, and I've got to try to wind this up today. I've talked to people who... Um, a little careless about who they talk religion with. Let's put it that way. I know somebody who said, well, you know, I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come in and I'll let them tell me their doctrine and I'll let them tell me their beliefs and, you know, I don't mind doing that and I've had Mormons come into my house and, and I'll talk to them about religion and blah, blah, blah. And I said to them, I said, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire. You've got this mindset that, well, you know, who's to say we're all right? Who's to say we know everything? You know, maybe they've got something right that we don't have right. Maybe, and I'm going to tell you a little secret. Satan is wise. The Word of God said he is very wise and he is very knowledgeable. He does not present true, excuse me, a lie, except that it's wrapped with bacon that we call truth. Every lie the enemy will try to tell you, he will wrap in a truth. And I'm going to tell you something about cults. I've studied cults for many, many years. Matter of fact, I started studying cults when I was about 12 years old. I began to read books that um, began to articulate the teaching of cults and the practices of cults. Uh, there's a book out there, been out there for well over half a century called The Kingdom of the Cults. Uh, I've read, oh, dozens of books that deal with various cults, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness. I've read books by former JW, former Mormons. Uh, I've read books on Scientology. I've read books on um, uh, Christian scientists, which are different than Scientology. A lot of people think it's the same. It's a very different thing. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy and her crowd over there at the uh, Christian Science, you know. And uh, I've, I've done a lot of study on these things. And I'm going to tell you right now, you better know what you believe if you're going to talk to these people because their whole scheme is literally designed to deceive. They literally have, they have created a program that will deceive the word of God said even the very elect. They have created a system. It is literally something, folks, that these people have crafted over the course of many, many years. And where they say, oh, we need to tweak this. We need to tweak that. Uh, and we're not going to get them in unless we change this, you know. We don't tell them at their doorstep that we believe Michael is Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. We don't tell them that at the doorstep. Oh, no. Because you know what? Most people who know anything about Christianity, they're going to immediately turn you off if you say that. Even if they're not real Christians. Even if they're not, you know, really involved in church. They're going to know enough to say, well, that's crazy. No, that ain't right. And they're going to turn you off. So what do the JWs do? Don't you mention nothing about the Michael Doctrine. If they ask you, kind of worm your way out of it. Don't answer that question. Kind of stay away from that. Same thing with the Mormons. Jesus is 
Satan's brother, and they're both gods who are under the father, Elohim, and Elohim is really our grandfather, not our father. Oh, I'm telling you folks, you get into the Mormon doctrine, you'll be shocked what you learn. Jesus and Satan are brothers, according to Mormonism. You better be careful. No, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. I'm not going to study with them. I'm not going to worship them. I'm not going to engage in any religious or any ritual practice with them. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, does that mean I won't love them, that I won't accept them, that I won't hug them, that I won't be friendly with them, that I won't be kind to them, that I won't even allow them in my home? I, I go in, in Tommy's parents' home. They're elders in the Jehovah's Witness movement. I've been in their home, and we sat there and visited, had nice talks, had nice conversations, and they never brought up religion one time. Right, Booby? Mm -hmm. And that works, because the minute they start going into religion, because I don't want to argue with them, and I don't want to be argumentative, I don't want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to excuse myself and leave. You follow what I'm saying? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works. Yes. Has nothing to do with the people. We're supposed to walk as believers with open hearts. Yes. But we're also supposed to walk with a made up mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. We know what we believe. We know where we stand. And no matter what anybody else believes, because I mean, I guarantee you, there, there are people in churches, holiness churches today, there are people in long hair, high hair, long sleeve, holiness churches today who believe that I can be a Christian. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Now, if they said that to the rest of the church, they'd be thrown out on their ear. But I meet Christian people every day. I talk to people every day. Well, I'm part of this Church of Christ. I'm part of that Baptist Church. I'm part of this Assembly of God. I'm part of that UPC. And when we talk, they say to me, I believe you can be a child of God. I believe that. I don't believe for a minute you chose to be gay. I don't believe for a minute you chose this as a lifestyle. I believe it is innate to you. It is natural to you. And therefore, I believe I have had people of every religious persuasion tell me that. You know why? Because in every church, whether you like it or not, everybody is not marching with the same drum. Everybody does not believe every point of doctrine. And if you're going, like Paul said, him that is weak in the faith, if they're believing wrong, if, if what they're believing is wrong, if everybody in the church is going to start debating and arguing over everything you disagree on, guess what? The house of God is going to become chaos. So you stay in your lane. If you ever notice, I preach a lot about staying in your lane. That's an important principle in the faith. It's a principle you don't hear a lot of preachers preach on, but they need to. You stay in your lane. You don't need to fix everybody else. You don't need that they're a little off here and a little off there. No, receive them. Paul says, if they're a little weak in the faith, receive them. But not to doubtful disputations. And in the end, let every man be convinced in his own mind. Tommy read the scripture earlier. And this scripture is so ap apropos to this message. Again, it's in the same chapter, Romans 14. It's just down a little further, a chapter of verses 12 through 14. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Got news for you, Brother Parsley. God doesn't give a rat's patootie what your opinion of my salvation is. 
When I stand before God in the judgment, I guarantee you Jesus is not going to turn to you and say, Hey, Rod, uh, should, should I let this guy in or not? I, 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 your opinion is important to me. I, I want to make sure you're in agreement with me. No, it ain't going to happen. Every man shall give account. Every one of us shall give account of who? Himself. Well, honey, if you're going to give account of yourself, then guess who you ought always to be concerned with? Guess who you ought always be working on? If you need to fix anybody, guess who you ought to be fixing? Yourself. Because in the end, you're the only one that you're going to answer to God for. So you spend all your time trying to fix everybody else, you're neglecting yourself. You spend all your time changing everybody else's oil and your engine blows because you forgot to change yours. You were so busy working on everybody else's car. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. So every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. How much clearer could Paul make this? But judge this rather, that no man put a stop block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You know why most gay people are, are church phobic today? You know why most LGBT people today have such a hard time going into a church? Because something that put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in their way. Instead of saying, well, I don't agree with their position. I don't agree with what they allow. I don't agree with what they think on this issue. But I'm going to approach them with an open heart. I'm going to love them anyway. But not to, to, to doubtful just I'm not going to argue with them. I'm not going to debate them. I'm just going to love them because that's what I'm called to do. I'm called to walk with an open heart. Now, I've got to be that. I know what I believe. But... Only person I'm going to answer to God for is me. So I need to keep my mouth shut. And if God needs to change that person, he will do so through the preaching of the word. And if that person don't change, then honey, it didn't need to be changed. Great. Yes, yes. Listen, let us not therefore judge one another, but judge this rather than no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know, listen to what Paul said, I know and am fully persuaded by who? By the Lord Jesus. What? That there is nothing. I'm going to be like my black brethren now. Everybody say with me, nothing. Nothing. There is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth it anything to the unclean, to him it is unclean. So you've got a problem with homosexuality, then you better be straight. But that brother in the church who's gay and is trying to live for God and is doing the best they can to live for the Lord, you keep your mouth shut. Let them do what they're doing. And if God needs to change anything, he'll change it. And if God don't change it, then he was okay with it from the start. Mm -hmm. But let every man, the word of the Lord said, work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. I fear God. I don't want to step before God in the judgment and find out I was wrong the whole time. No, no, no. No, I went to the scripture. I searched it out. I studied till I thought I was going to lose my mind. And I found things in my studies that I never knew that blew my mind. Things I thought I knew what the Bible said about gay people. I thought I knew what the Bible said about being homosexual. And when I really dug, and when I really got in there, when I really went into the Greek, when I went into the Hebrew, when I began to look at the stories more honestly and more openly, all of a sudden God opened my eyes and I realized, holy mackerel, I didn't know nothing. I didn't know half of what I thought I knew. So in the end, if the church would do what Paul was teaching today, if they would walk with 
an open heart and a made up mind, there'd be so much harmony and so much peace in the church. People could have different opinions. They could have different views. They could have different understandings. But they could still walk in the unity of the faith. Because we all still believe there's one God and Jesus is His name. We all still believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. We all believe Jesus lived a sinless life. Went to the cross of Calvary as the Lamb of God. To serve as a sacrifice on our behalf. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb. That three days later he woke up, hallelujah, took off the garments they had placed them in to bury him, folded them, laid them aside, and walked out of that tomb a whole man, hallelujah, glory to God. And that some days later he ascended, he got a machine, oh glory to God, he ascended into heaven. Hallelujah. Oh my God, have mercy. He didn't have to die again to get there. Glory. He ascended. And one day he's going to meet us in the clouds and we're going to ascend just like he did. We all still believe those fundamentals. And those are the things, folks. Not baking cakes for gay couples. Those are the things that we ought to defend. Those are the things that we ought to hold on to with all of our might. Those are the fundamentals of our faith that make us one in Christ Jesus. Those are the truths we celebrate when we take the Lord's Supper and we take communion. Those are the truths we celebrate. We need to get it right. God has called us to walk with an open heart and a made up mind. Hallelujah.